page that we're yes. live on? Perfect. Yeah. I think it actually we might not have been live just now. I think I didn't hit the go live button. Oh, perfect. So we're live now. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're going to wait for a few people to show up. We got some people logging on. All right, everyone. Welcome, Tom. We have people. I got to switch over to my. Um... Hey, Jared. Jared's on. And um, we've got Tom Kuhn on and Jeff on. If um, we are live on Facebook this morning, um, sharing this webinar, we've got a few people joining us today. We went, Bonnie and I decided at the last minute to, to go live because we wanted to be able to share this, um, this awesome information that Bonnie has for us today on the three C's of communication. So how is, does this work today? So when you join us, you can um, click on the chat box to go ahead and ask us questions um, or ask Bonnie questions directly about her three C's and how to maximize the most fantastic communication. And you can also click over on the Q&A box and you can ask a question directly from the Q&A box. I will be monitoring both as the facilitator to this webinar. Um, also, if you would like to, um, if you would like to be promoted to a panelist, or you would like to join in live, I know, I know, um, both Tom and Jared, who are on with us now, are. Well, Jared's going to be one of our coaches for next week. And then everybody knows who Tom Kuhn is. I mean, who doesn't know the famous Tom Kuhn? Um, so Tom or Jared, if you guys would like to join us on the panelist list, please just um, let me know and I will add you to the panelist list. Um, and I, okay, so let me introduce Bonnie. Um, <laughs> Bonnie Bonadeo is, um, she's, she's been in the industry for many years. And it's interesting because Bonnie started as a licensed cosmetologist. I don't know if a lot of people know that, that mm -hmm. Bonnie actually does have a license. And, um, and then she quickly went into the distributor uh, ship and worked for different distributors. And then she moved from that realm. And I think you went into PBA, right? Did you join PBA right about that time? Yep, worked for a few manufacturers in between. Most of it was, you know, working for distributors and manufacturers and then, then PBA. And um, what manufacturers did you work for, Bonnie? I worked for Matrix, Sebastian, and ABBA. All righty. And some good ones there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when you went to PBA, what was your um, job at PBA? I was the director of education, so I got the privilege of putting together all their shows and events. We uh, I think my first year there, we actually did, we had Hair World here in the United States in Vegas. So that was like my first like show to put together was Hair World. Um, and I got to produce Naha for 10 years, uh, ISSEs. I got to launch the Cosmoprof North America show. Um, but I, I did a lot of work, back end work on the old TSA days, the symposiums. Um, loved doing all that. That was, that was, uh, that was my, it's, I think Naha was my greatest love in the industry so far was really giving hairstylists a platform to get recognized. 
Well, that's fantastic. That's actually some pretty exciting stuff that you mm -hmm. were able to do. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> see you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you want, Jeff, if you want your um, video on, you can have it on. If you want it off, I believe there's a way to turn it off if you, but what we'd like to have you, you're muted right now. So you would need to unmute yourself. Um, okay, Bonnie, um, I, uh, back to, you were at PBA and you, you were involved in, um, all of these awesome educational events and Naha being your most favorite, understandably so. Um, and then you, about what, 10 years ago? 15. Maybe not. Oh, 10 years ago. Yes. 10 years ago when I started. Left. Yeah. You left PBA and you started the um, Beauty Agents Network. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what the Beauty Agent Network is? Well, it's a resource for educators, education and business resources. So if you're looking for an educator to come educate with you, you can source them on the Beauty Agent Network. Uh, if you're an educator and you want to get promoted or showcased, you can join. It's a membership, annual membership. Um, and if you're a business resource, if you're a company that offers tools or education, um, miscellaneous things, other than just like, you know, your typical liquid product line, uh, you have an opportunity to get showcased on there as well um, to be able to get the word out. Because I know that sometimes small business um, and as we start out as entrepreneurs, we need to collaborate as much as we can to be able to support each other and getting it out there. And so it's a, it's a, it's a great resource. Yeah, we, that's, that's my whole thing is, is unity in the industry and we do need to collaborate as much as possible. So, um, Bonnie, it, it seems like your entire career really has been really education driven. It, it really has, you know, it's for me, when I first started out doing hair, I was incredibly uneducated and I had a lot, I had no confidence in doing hair. I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't learn what I needed to learn at the time in beauty school. Um, and if people in the salon were generous enough to help me, then I could get through a day. But if the, you know, if my fellow workers were too busy to help me on things that I didn't have an understanding of, I was like, where do I go? Where do I go for education? And, and that was kind of my moment of realizing maybe this is not what I need to be doing. Maybe what I need to be doing is help other educators that felt like me to be better educated and feel more confident about what they're doing and ended up on that business education side of the industry. And that, uh, you know, that led to all of the opportunities to work with distributors and manufacturers and PBA. And I just flip flop between sales and education roles all the time in my career. And, uh, you know, unlike the hairdresser that hates to sell products, you know, I, I was the hairdresser who couldn't wait to go work for somebody and sell products. Um, and uh, because I knew that the products came with the education, the education came with the learning, the learning came with the success. And there you go. Without, without learning, without knowledge, without education, we just, we just sort of stay stagnant. And um, I have a comment from Jared here that he says collabor collaboration is the key. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's what Jared and Oscar and Bonnie and I are doing in this five part webinar series is we've decided to collaborate as coaches and professionals to be able to bring um, the industry more, um, more knowledge, more education on the business end of it, not so much on the technical end of it, so that we can empower not only salon owners, but people who potentially want to be salon owners um, and, uh, and, and, and even just hairdressers in, in general to not have to put so that they have an awareness of today, we're going to be talking about communication in a minute, so that they have an uh, awareness of what communication is and 
And Jared, next week, Jared is going to be speaking on high performance attitude and how um, to evoke that high performance attitude within yourself as a hairstylist and from an owner's perspective, because Jared is also an owner. And then Oscar Valencia will also be joining us the following week. And Oscar will be discussing culture and how to create a, a team minded culture. Oscar has some really great um, team models to bring your team through. And then I'm going to be talking about leadership. And then the very last week, we're going to be discussing hiring. Um, so Let's get into this webinar today, Bonnie, and I'm okay. going to shut up for a while and let you have the floor. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen because we've got some stuff to talk about. Here we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Can you see it, Kim? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Good because it's just my screen on the other end. So, all right, you guys, so this is the three C's of communication. And, and I, we're all challenged by this. This is a big topic. So I'm just going to narrow it down and keep it as simple as possible um, and as succinct as possible as well. But here's, here, here's my motto on it. It's about being effective and it's about being liked. Because a lot of times we get caught up in communication where it ends up being conflict or it ends up being a battle. And our entire goal and existence on all of this is like, I still want to be liked, but I want to be effective in what I'm saying and doing. You could look at communication as, you know, how to be able to build your clientele um, or how to be able to like, you know, just make sure that that you're being a good leader. And I know Kim's an expert on leadership here, um, but it's been one of my passions. And partly it's been one of my passions because you know, I got fired from a leadership position early on in my career. Um, and when I got fired, uh, it, here's how the story goes. And maybe you, some of you guys can piece it together. But I was an educator for a major manufacturer and I loved, loved, loved the job. I loved it. And um, next thing you know, and this was typical of it happening to me, even at a young age, that they'd want to promote me up to being manager because it seemed like I was in total control of everything. So I got promoted to manager. And um, when I was an educator, I spent six weeks in a training course to be that educator, you know, know the product inside and out, know everything of how to be able to teach the product and learn the ins and outs of the company and all that stuff. And, um, and was very successful as an educator for this company. But then they promoted me to a manager. And I was very excited about this opportunity because I felt like it was a great upgrade for my life and the direction that I wanted to go working for um, a company like this. And so I was a manager for maybe, maybe a year, not more than a year, certainly. And I was heading to uh, a, a, an event um, that was out of town. So I was on a plane. And when I got off the plane, and this is this is early days before TSA, when you could actually meet people at the jet end of the jetway. And I here I was, I was uh, getting off the plane. And at the end of the jetway, I could see my boss. And I'm thinking, hmm. And in that moment, I knew something didn't feel right. But I didn't know. I couldn't imagine why my boss was meeting me at the end of the jetway. And as we got off the plane and we acknowledged each other, and by the time we got to baggage claim, she had fired me. And I remembered just seeing the carousel with my, you know, the luggage coming out, going round and round and round. And I'm like, what has just happened? I mean, I seriously just won the President's Eagle Award at a, you know, at the company convention I was up on stage accepting this from the president of the company. And now like a month later, I'm getting fired. So I was very, very confused. And I knew in that moment, I had to ask a couple of good questions. And so I kind of mustered up the courage to be able to ask the question. And the first question I asked was, why are you firing me? Right. Um, and the answer was because you're not a very good manager. And I thought for a minute, I thought, I've got no basis. I've got no foundation to say I am or am not. You know, I'm not college educated. 
Um, I, you know, I got promoted up from being an educator. I'd never been in a formal management position up to this point. So I couldn't argue that point whatsoever. So I thought, well, I just need to ask another question here before, you know, my luggage comes off this carousel and I'm on my way back home jobless. And I remembered saying, so my net, I said to her, I said, my next question is, how, when were you planning on training me to be a good manager, knowing that I spent six weeks preparing to be a great educator? When were you going to train me to be a good manager? And she said, you should have already known how to manage. Now, at that time, I was 22 years old. I did not know how to manage. I really did not have the any formal training on leadership and management. And I knew at that point that was the opportunity to be able to go back to school, read books, go to seminars. You know, we didn't have webinars back in the day like this, but I would have attended every one of them that was about leadership and communications. And I made it my mission to be able to continue to refine how to be a great leader. And all of that really kind of summed up you got to be a great communicator. So we're going to look at the three C's of communications here and how that actually makes an impact on us to be able to be successful or not. So here's what I want you all to do that are listening and watching us on Facebook. I want you to think of a person that you're having difficulties communicating with. So one person could be several, who knows, but think of one person that you're having difficulties communicating with. Okay. All right. You got that person in your mind. All right. Now, what do you believe the problem is? What do you believe is the problem? Is it something specific? You know, it could be family. It could be a, somebody you work with. It could be a significant other. Or it could be a past ex or someone like that. What do you believe is the problem? And if you pointed the finger outward to them, then it's most likely a communication problem. So did you point the finger outward? Did you say something like they did this or they did that or something in that realm? And maybe you didn't turn the finger back on yourself and take any accountability or responsibility for it. And this is our first lesson in communication is be able, being able to really understand that we have to have a significant amount of ownership in poor communication um, because, because we hear things differently and each of us have a different experience and we've all experienced different circumstances in our life. So we're all hearing from different filters and we can't make assumptions when it comes to communicating. Now, you can go ahead, be in denial Break the mirror that you're looking at right now and not being able to blame you and say, it's not me, it's them. It's not me, it's them. But the truth is that communication is a two-way street and it probably is you. And if you're looking at how to be able to be successful, build your business, grow a clientele, lead people to success as well, then communication is going to be one of the most important qualities that you should have. So being effective and being light. And I say being effective because we can all learn new skills to be better communicators. The being liked is, this is kind of like an old philosophy to leadership. It's like, I don't care if they like me, I'm the boss. But guess what? As human beings, we do care. We do care if we are liked and we want to be liked and we want to friend people and we want to be, you know, that, that person that's not the meanie pants. But we also then cross the line of not being effective at times when we're communicating or leading. So most of the time, this is like an epic fail here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this back out because I realized I didn't set this up to be able to, um, uh, hang on. I didn't set it up to be able to flow in. So we're going to look at some definitions here of communication and and. The top one here, and I'll, I'll, I'll showcase it here in the end as well. The, the funny thing about the word communication, if you look up the title of it, they use the word communicating as part of the definition. So how confusing is that if communication has to have the word communication in it in order to be defined? So like on the bottom here, communication definition, the actor process of communicating, the fact of being communicated. 
<laughs> well, that doesn't help anybody to really understand the depth of communication. Most of them are epic fails in regards to how they define communication because neither one of them really put or represent that listening is probably the most important feature of communicating. Now, we as human beings, and especially we as kind of Americans, we, we take pride in speaking. We love to speak. We love talking. We love sharing. We love doing all of this. In other cultures, there might be more listening um, behaviors and listening skills versus talking skills, but we're really good at speaking here. So we sometimes fail in our communications by not being able to listen. So here's how I define communication, to acknowledge and be acknowledged, to listen and be listened to, to understand and be understood. And when you realize that it is truly a two-way street, that you have to acknowledge people and then you're looking for acknowledgement back, you want to be heard, they wanna be heard, and then understanding can step in and then you can be understood. And at that point, communication might actually be a favorable thing or a skill set that you're succeeding at in here. Now, one of the ones, the one on the top that you can't see right now that I've covered up here, it says, and, it, and it's probably one of the critical definitions in here, is a feeling. Communicating is a feeling, transferring a feeling to another. So if you understand that there it should be a feeling connected to communicating, then you have to really be very aware of what that feeling is. Because most of the time, we are igniting, uh, we're igniting defensiveness in our communication styles. And I think anybody can believe that just if you watch even five seconds of the news, that it's it's negative, it's defensive, where everybody's trying to defend their, their point of view in the opportunity of being able to communicate or share outwards. So if we know that the de definition of communication is an epic fail, then we have to really say, what is communication? Well, here's the three C's that we're gonna talk about today. One, curiosity, two, compassion, and three, connection. All three of those, I say is what, the simplicity of making your communication be the most effective. Now, there's a ton of other C's that you could add to it, along with A's and B's and E's and D's. Uh, but I think if you try to keep it as simple as possible and look at these three, you'll start to see how they can make, they can connect the dots for you to being able to make sure that you are communicating effectively. And I'll use some examples from both parties, parties that are like, uh, 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 stylist working with their clients and leaders working with their team. So let's talk about curiosity, the very first one here. How curious are you in your communications? A lot of times we're very, very good at making statements versus asking questions. And what's the difference between a statement and a question? If you declare a statement, then you already know the answer to it. They both can end in a question mark, but a statement is that you already know the answer to it. If you're really effective in asking the right questions, then you don't know the answer and it's coming from a place of curiosity. And if you're curious about where this conversation is going or what is what you need to communicate on, then you're going to be a whole lot more open to the possibilities of having a great outcome and some good results. So curiosity is really looking within the soul and asking yourself the questions and then asking questions of others. The most important thing that we see a lot of times is when I see communication failing is Instead of being curious as to what people are trying to say, we immediately become defensive on what they're saying, and then it triggers our defense mechanism, and then all we want to do is be right. And you know, the, you, know the, you know the story here. If I'm right, then it makes you wrong. There's no two rights here. If I'm right, then you have to be wrong. And there's where conflict sits in a communication. So if I don't need to be right, or if I don't have enough information to be right, then I better be curious. And 
figure out the questions I need to ask to gain more information so that we can come to that place of understanding. And if I'm asking questions, then I have to and must listen to the answers that are being shared. I can't ask a question and then be ready for my reply just to prove I'm right again. If I ask a question, I have to listen actively in order to be able to be prepared to hear the answer that they're providing me. The second C is compassion. And compassion is, oh, very missed. We might be curious as to why we're in some of these unhealthy communication roles. But a lot of times what we don't see is the opportunity to add compassion to them. And compassion is what I consider to be a form of acknowledgement, a form of acknowledgement. So let me give you an example of that. You know, all those posts that are up there and people like actually take their phone, their text messages that they're doing with their clients and their client has said, um, I'm not happy with my hair. Can you fix it? And the stylist then responds to that particular text. And then the stylist posted on some, you know, hairdresser uh, uh, group to be able to get advice from all of us on what has just happened. And did they, they're looking for kind of affirmation and confirmation, you know, did I do this right? Or what should I do? I don't know what to do with this client that's saying that I screwed up her hair or didn't do her hair right or whatever the case is. This is the greatest opportunity for compassion here. So let's say that the, the client says, um, I don't like my hair, can you fix it? We immediately, because hair is an art and it's our personal art, you know, it's not like we're selling a product that we just happen to work for. What we just did with that client is personal and it's ours and nobody else could have duplicated it exactly like we did. So we become internally offended. And then we think, but she liked her hair before we left, before she left. She didn't say anything when I left. I even asked her, how do you like it? And she said, I love it. It's great. Now she's texting me back and telling me she doesn't like my hair and she wants me to fix it. But this is the opportunity to add compassion to it. So the text was, you know, um, I, can you fix my hair? I don't like it. Compassion is adding words to it where you're acknowledging what she's saying in that moment, not trying to fix it or add to it or uncover maybe just yet. Compassion would be the part where you're just like, thank you for reaching out to me. That in itself is compassion. And that in itself, that little statement right there will diffuse defensiveness. Because if you say, if you go right into the question of what don't you like about it, that person may get defensive and then you get defensive and then the conflict is already on its way. So compassion says, thank you for reaching out to me. Boom, diffuse any type of conflict. Can you tell me what it is you don't like about it? I wanted it to be blonder. I understand. Would you like to schedule another appointment with me? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. See you soon. They, there's nothing in there about conflict in there. What happens is that we don't add compassion to the front end of this. And then what triggers defensiveness and then boom, we're off and running and we're going down the rabbit hole of being able to, he said, she said, I thought you liked it. What is wrong with it? And, and even think about the words that we're using in communication. So I said, what is it that you don't like about it? But a lot of times what we say in our communication is we'll say something like, what's wrong with it? And again, those type of words can trigger defensiveness as well. So compassion is key and number two. So what you don't know about the, search, the situation, the circumstance and the person. And a lot of times in our communications when they take that role of being an epic fail is because we make assumptions that we know what we know. But you have to then go back to the number one C, which is curiosity. What don't you know about the situation that you could reply differently to have a different outcome on it? What don't you know about the situation? And that's the part of being curious. And then once you kind of figure out, I don't really know why she doesn't like it, then that's the question to ask. And then ask that question with compassion. 
And compassion is kind of like, you know, adding a little bit of a, of a connective tone to it. Um, like I did in the beginning where it was like, thank you for reaching out. Or you could say, and you have to be careful how you're even saying this, because I'm, I'm not suggesting that you have to apologize for doing a bad job if you didn't think you did a bad job to begin with. So you could say, thank you so much for reaching out. I, I, I'm sorry to hear you're unhappy. Can you let me know what is the problem? Or can you let me, let me know what is it you don't like about it? Something in that term. So you've softened up that whole front end of that approach. Now they can be truthful and honest with you. And then you can accept and decide where to go from there. Good. All right. We're moving on here. Um, connection. Uh, C number three is connection. Now, if you're not curious and if you are not compassionate, there's a good chance you won't have connection. There's a really good chance that you won't have connection. And connection is the only part that's going to resolve the issue. You could be as smart as you want. You could be as right as you need to be. You could be like, I even showed you the color I was going to do or the formula I was going to do, or I even, you know, showed you how much haircut I, hair I was going to be taking off. You could be completely right in all of those areas. And none of that's going to matter about being right or being accurate or, you know, thinking that you did the right thing if there's not connection present in that. And connection goes back to acknowledgement and feeling understood. Most of us as humans, we want to be heard. We want to feel safe in our communications and we want to be heard. But being heard is only valid if there's acknowledgement on the other end. And acknowledgement is sometimes as simple as saying, I understand what you just said. I hear what you're saying. I think that you, the choice you're making is a good one. That's acknowledgement. That just proves that you heard what they were saying. And now the conversation or the communication can carry on to a different level. When we're looking at um, a leadership role, and I talk with a lot of leaders, and I'm sure Kim can you know, attest to this as well, that in coaching my clients that are leaders of organizations um, or businesses, a lot of times, most of what I coach on is the communication of them and their team. Like something went wrong and they're not sure how to be able to handle it. And I always go back to these three C's and I always say, well, do you know for a fact that that's what happened? What are you curious about in regards to this particular behavior that's showing up? What's a compassionate way to approach them or to be able to gain more information? And are you prepared to make sure that the conversation is as connected as possible and not disconnected or not like a flyby conversation. You never want to lead or manage people in a flyby conversation. You want to make sure that you're sitting down and, and having a great conversation about it. So connection is really valid. Connection also happens in our brains. And the part of the connection that happens in our brains is because we have the ability to be able to feel as well as think. But here's the truth. We always feel emotions before we think analytically. We feel something before we think. We have feeling before thought. So the way that somebody feels is going to definitely dominate any conversation. So if you have personally offended somebody or unintentionally offended somebody, that feeling is going to go into protective mode. And they're not going to feel safe communicating with you any further. And then they're going to do whatever they can to be able to protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got the three C's here, but let's tap into a couple more. And we're going to do a Q&A afterwards, too. So we'll have some examples as, where to be, as, as well to be able to share. But think about it from, whoops, sorry, I went too fast. It's not about, connection is not about what you see or what you say. Connection is always about what you feel. So you have to think about what are you feeling in this moment, but just as importantly, what might they be feeling in this moment? So when your people are feeling heard and feeling safe, it's allowing connection to be able to happen. And connection happens in the brain first. Okay, so kind of triggers that ability to be able to say, I feel safe 
I'm going to communicate. I'm going to speak my truth. I'm going to say what I need to say. And a lot of times just in trying to speak our truth, we might offend people, but it's okay. You know, create some compassionate uh, compassion around that ability to try and connect with people. All righty, we're moving on. So most of the posts that I see on these group pages, they are all communication problems. Every single one of them is a communication problem. Now, it might have stemmed from the consultation. It might have stemmed from somewhere in between the, the say, the, the process of being able to um, have the conversation with the team member or have that conversation with the client. But no matter what, all of those are conversations. So I did a post to be able to promote this webinar um, last week. And the post said this. It said, usually when somebody is making a post or looking for advice on these type of forums, uh, there's three types of replies that happen. The first reply is the supporter. And the supporter is somebody that's like, you did the right thing. Just keep going. You don't need them anyway. It's all right. You, I think you handled it just fine. Okay. So it's confirmation and their people are like, oh, okay, I did okay, I did okay. The second type of reply is the analyzer. And the analyzer does two things. One, they are curious and they want to know a little bit more information before providing you advice. So they'll be like, you know, did you look into this or did you do this or did you use that or did you say this? And then once you kind of reply back to them, of, I did, I told them that, you know, I have a, I have a 24 hour, you know, uh, uh, cancellation policy type of thing. Then they'll provide you advice and it could be good advice. It could be fair advice. It, either way, it's they're probably looking to be able to contribute advice and you'll have to take it as that. The third person is more of the fighter and the fighter is the one that just blatantly says what they want to say. And the fighter is the one that's like, fire them. You don't need them. Get rid of them. Find new. And there's kind of no softness in between. And I can only imagine that people that put these type of posts up on these forums to be able to get advice are more confused after they post it than before they post it. And what I say is that you probably already know the answer to the problem that you're having, and you probably knew it somewhere in between. You probably knew where the communication had failed at some point. And the, the problem that we have with this problem is that we're not willing to go back and kind of reopen an existing conversation in a different way. We usually then just try to ignore it you know, act like it doesn't exist, brush it under the table, um, or we fight back and we fight back with fury. And sometimes that's like a loss of a, a relationship, a loss of a client, a, a team member that you don't feel very supported, doesn't feel very supported anymore and will eventually leave. So my suggestion is to be able to apply curiosity, compassion, and connection and see if the outcome doesn't change the next time you go around. And I'm talking, it doesn't change just the one time. Every time, every communication that you have should be attached with curiosity, compassion, and connection. And every single time you will have a different outcome than what you've had before. And listen, we didn't learn communication in school. There wasn't like, you know, communication 101. We're, we, we learned communication within our upbringing, within our family, how our families communicated with each other. And then that's what we brought into our workforce. And then you add all of the technology and all of the social media that's happening right now. And we just have more and more of a difficult time being able to simply communicate. We're trying to communicate via text. And we know every time that texting is the worst place to be able to do communication. Um, communication via uh, social media. You know, it sometimes it just comes across wrong and and we are not being as compassionate or as curious as we need to. And we know that the ability to be able to connect with other people is that greatest fulfillment for us. And, you know, when connection happens, you feel it. You don't just see it. You feel it. And that's when a conversation has gone well is when you have that connectiveness and you can feel the compassion and you really care about that other person. There's another C right there. You care about that other person. All right. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple quotes and then we're going to open it up for some opportunity for people to ask questions. So start plugging in your questions now. Um, 
either if you're live on Facebook with us or if you're on the webinar with us and then Kim will help sort through some of those questions and um, we can do some, you know, let us know maybe an area that you're having difficulties in and, and I'll support you with some um, ideas and some coaching. But here's one of my favorite quotes is the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. So we think we've communicated effectively or fully in a situation that goes wrong. And the truth is, is we probably didn't communicate as well as we thought we did, or we didn't communicate at all. We're just like, well, they should know that, right? They should know that. Yeah. Or how about this one? Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. So if you ask a question, you have to really listen to what the answer is, because if you're really coming from a place of curiosity, the only reply that you have has got to be based on what they've just said. And if it's based on what they just said, connection happens automatically because they know that you are engaged in that conversation and they feel acknowledged by being heard. And then the last one here, no matter what job you have in life, your success will be determined 5% by your academic credentials, 15% by your professional experiences and 80% by your communication skills. And I'm still a firm believer in that. I think that you can build up an amazing clientele in this industry by having great communication skills and of course, good technical skills, but you can be really, really great at communication skills and build an amazing clientele. And it's not about, you know, it's not about the, the foundation of knowledge um, or the college degree it is about being able to communicate effectively because that's how we learn too. Communication is a form of learning. So the, the better we are at communicating, the better we are at learning and the better we are at then succeeding as well. Yeah. So curiosity, compassion, connection. So I'm curious, what questions do you guys have at this time that we can uh, support you with and be able to answer? Kim, what you got going on? Any questions coming up or what comments? I don't have any questions. I have a comment from uh, Tom Kuhn. You want to take you off screen share because I think it's, yep. um, I think it is, um, let's see, maybe that will um, add me in. So, uh, uh, Tom Kuhn said had a different uh, had an interesting point here. Let me see it. Um, to Bonnie's point, eighty seven percent of executives rate themselves as effective communicators. Um, only seventeen percent of their audience agree. Mm. Source: The Leader's Voice. Um, so that is. Interesting. And so that leads me to believe that, you know, we as leaders or managers, you know, we going to your point of, of accountability and that um, assumption that we assume we're communicating mm -hmm. well, right? Um, so he had that in his interesting point and yeah. we've got a couple people on here watching but no questions yet but i do have some um comments but before i make those comments um if people watching or listening if you're on the webinar um you can type your question into the q a box if you are watching live on Facebook, you can type your questions into the comments box, and uh, I will I will try and manage all of them. Um, but the one thing, you know, in the beginning of your um, of your uh, presentation, you talked about you know your love for leadership, which is you know my love as well. I mean that's my passion, and the reason it is my passion is for a lot of the same reasons as you have. Um, but it's interesting because you made the same point that I always point out to people 
that we, and it's not just in our industry, it's pretty much in every single business. Mm -hmm. It's true. We promote people for performance and we expect them to be good leaders. So we have no, you know, there is such little leadership training and knowledge on leadership. And and when I did the John Maxwell program, I was just sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, like, why didn't I know this stuff when I had my, my business? It's, Mm-hmm. It's kind of sad. So then that became my passion to deliver those messages to our industry. Yeah, I, it's, you know, I, I just did a, a class at Jeff's Salon, Intrigue Salon here in Atlanta. And, and, and I tell you, it was 15 minutes. It was a 15 minute little quickie. And uh, it was based on consultations. And so uh, I want to say that it was L'Oreal that had some statistics recently out there that they said, um, 90% of stylists think they do a good consultation <laughs> and like 7% of clients actually felt that they even got a consultation. It's like, how could there be such a huge discrepancy between a stylist believing that they're doing a great consultation and a client feeling like they didn't get one at all, you know, and, and all of that is kind of in that communication realm of lack of acknowledgement we're not acknowledging what the client's saying in a way for the client to feel heard. So then they think that we're not listening or that we're not paying attention or that we just are on our own agenda. And a lot of times I think is when we take that expertise role, we are on our own agenda. We're, we like look at their hair and go, oh, we know what we need to do. And we don't really listen fully to what the client's saying. And that same example transfers over to leadership with our teams. We assume that, you know, we already know what's going on or that they know what's going on. And then we have this ineffective way of being able to communicate back with our teams or there's fear attached to being able to connect effectively to our teams. We're afraid to say what we really want to say. Deathly afraid to say something, especially if it's going down the path of, I need to help them grow and prosper. And I need to tell them that maybe they're not very good at something. And we panic thinking that we can't tell them that. So like an example of that would be, you know, uh, you know, how do I, how do I let my stylist know that, you know, they're, they're falling way behind on retail and they know it, but they're, they're just, there's no improvement in it. And, you know, and I, this is a, this is a, this is a great coaching formula and I I use it a lot and it's a, it's a good one to be able to use as a leader for the team. And the question is, is being able to evaluate uh, the opportunity by using it like as a rating system. So you could say to the, to the stylist and you could say, so I want to be able to work with you on being able to improve your, your retailing skills. So on a scale of one to 10, where do you think you are at, at feeling confident in retailing? So there's a question. I don't know what the answer is going to be. So I'm coming from a place of curiosity. I have no idea how they're going to rate themselves. They know where they stand. So they know that they're probably not going to rate themselves high. So if they rate themselves low, like, oh gosh, maybe a four or a five, I know I'm not doing well at it. That's accountability right there. You've asked a question that they own the answer. And from that place is the first opportunity for you to be able to say, you know what? Okay, great. So let's look at some opportunities of how we can have you feel more confident in selling retail. And they're going to be like, okay, thank you. They're going to thank you for having this conversation with them because we all want to be better and we all want to please, you know, people. And we want to not get fired at the end of the day. We don't want to get fired. Right. Or hate our job. So that. It's kind of like being able to ask a question where you're just rating from one to 10 is a good way to support that person in holding themselves accountable to their answer and then being able to start a new conversation from there. Compassion is in that as well. So curiosity and compassion, and they're going to feel very connected as well. Okay. Oscar has a comment here. Um, We can repeat their words back to them. What I heard you say is blah, 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 blah. And there's, you know what, and I I don't disagree with that, but I don't, 
I don't also buy into that philosophy very often because I realize that it has a counterpart to it. And the counterpart is that if I'm just repeating it back to them and you're a fighter like me and Kim, I know you're a fighter too. I'm pretty much going to say, yeah, that's what I said. Can we move on? Like I already get irritated with people that repeat things like that. So one of the more effective tools that I use is kind of like an, uh, you know, a, Again, acknowledgement is big. And acknowledgement is nothing other than saying, I understand, I heard you. And then asking another question, which you put is like an open information question. You build what they said into the information to be able to then get more acknowledgement from them that you're on the right path and that you're going in the right direction with the communication that you have. I'm not a big fan of paraphrasing or paraphrasing. And for, for, the, for that reason is because it doesn't progress the conversation to the next level. But of course, acknowledging what they said and creating clarity is vital, it's vital. Yes, I, you know, it, it's interesting because you know, I've had, I've had conversations for a lot of years, taken a lot of classes on conversation. And it's interesting how you can miss a vital piece. <laughs> I was in a class with Jay Williams um, last fall. And that is one of the things that stood out to me. Um, he was doing the class actually for, um, uh, consultants, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, just for distributor for a product company. I, I won't mention the product company, but you know, when I walked away from that, I, I thought to myself, I don't think I always acknowledge what they're saying to me. Mm -hmm. I just immediately in my mind, I'm a really solution oriented person. So I just jump straight to the solution um, or to the questions, or, you know, I don't acknowledge back to them what they've just said. And, and, you know, Oscar says, you know, to, you know, his comment was, um, what I heard you say, blah, blah, blah. And, um, I have done that, but, um, even just something as simple as saying, uh, yes. I, I understand. I completely understand your point. Mm -hmm. And that and it doesn't and it doesn't always have to mean that you agree with what they're saying, but acknowledgement right. to progress the conversation to the next level is, is 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 pretty important. And we don't do it very well. We don't acknowledge when people have spoken and said something. It, acknowledgement is important because it gives validation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when we give when we give validation in a conversation, whether it's to a client or to a team member or to an employee, when we give that validation, what it does, and then going to your other point, um, you said, you know, people that uh, people feel first before they think. And that's, that's true. However, we do have our subconscious mind. So our feelings or our gut reactions are based in that subconscious, subconscious mind, right? And so we're reacting to what we really believe subconsciously on a subconscious level. Absolutely. So by validating that that person's emotions or feelings, whether we agree with it or not, is is hugely vital in progressing the conversation mm -hmm. uh, positively forward. So yeah. I have a question by Tom here, Kuhn, and um, it says, "Nice work, Bonnie." Oh, thank you, Tom. I like I like the three C's. Of course, there's Tom validating you. <laughs> He's an effective. I feel teammate. acknowledged. <laughs> In the heat of the moment, how can they be applied? Any, sim any simple go-to trigger points to get you pre to get you present, such as a question to memorize. 
Yeah, it's, um, you know, I always feel like you have to be in the moment. And, and Tom, that's a really, really good question. I always feel like you have to be in the moment. But here's here, here's the difference of being in the moment is saying, okay, I, I, I need a moment to process that. Um, I think I heard what you said, but but can I clarify what it is you're trying to say? Because right now I feel like we're going in a, we're going in a different direction. So I'm whatever's coming up for me in that feeling of wanting to defend myself, wanting to fight back, wanting to run away from the conversation. Whatever you're feeling, because the feeling is going to then dictate how I'm going to approach or say something. And I'm going to, and I'm going to let them know that, or, you know, a lot of times it's like, I think I know what you're saying, but I might be confused. Can we create more clarity around it? I'm being a little vulnerable in not taking the conversation down a path that is going to lead us in a wrong direction. So I'm willing to be more vulnerable in a conversation of, I don't understand. I need help. Um, I don't get it. I, I might be confused. Can you help me here type of thing to be able to keep it at a, a more neutral place? Because here's what's true. When emotion rises, the other person's emotion is going to arise and you can't solve problems when you're in that emotional part of the brain. You cannot solve problems. The part of the brain that solves problems is this part right here. It's the neocortex. And it's like you talked about, Kim. That's the part that can solve problems. So if you're both in emotion and it's going back and forth like a, like a ping pong game, you're not going to be able to get to the solutions. So you have to address the emotion first, diffuse the emotion, and then be able to get to solutions. Get to the part of the brain that actively in, is engaged in fixing things. And it's not the emotional part of the brain. And then I see that Jared has uh, some questions too here. Um, yes, he has one. He says that the three powerful C's love it. What is the best way to communicate with somebody or someone that is challenging your values? Ooh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah. Um, I, and I guess, I guess Jared, from, from that point of view, it's that same thing of, of based on what I just said of, you know, I'm curious. I use, I use that word a lot. I'm curious. I feel as though I'm putting a lot of, you know, blah, blah, blah into this, wherever that goes, but it's adding those, that place of curiosity to the front end. So if you feel like they're challenging your values, are they aware of your values? Um, here's a, here's a, here's a, a statement that I say sometimes People don't do things to you. They do things for themselves. So when we're in those unconscious patterns or those unconscious behaviors of what we're doing, it's not like we're intentionally trying to defeat or be more powerful than another. We're doing something because we think it's the right thing to do for ourselves and we're not consciously aware of the outcome or the impact it has on others. So my question would be is, are they clear on your values? Have you communicated what your values are um, as being important? And if, and if that's the case, and if you don't have the answer to that, then that's the question you have to ask. Well, and, and, you know, to add to that, I posted um, online today, I have this, um, a tree that's called, uh, you know, it's, it's I, the leadership tree, culture tree, whatever you want to call it. And I like to use uh, a visual as a tree because your values always live at your roots. Mm -hmm. And it's, we're always wanting to focus on watering the roots of that tree so that then it can flourish. And yeah. what we don't realize is our systems live in the trunk of the tree, right? So communications, that is a system. So if we have good communication systems in place 
and I know Tom, Tom was just on, but one of the things that Tom taught me that I really value is um, four times, four ways, eight times, eight ways, 16, 16, mm -hmm. 16 times, 16 ways. Yep. So he, um, he, if, if you, you always want to communicate because we have all different types of learners, all different types of personalities that we deal with, whether we're behind the chair or whether it is um, in a leadership position. We have all different types of these learners. And so we need to communicate not only with our clients, but with our team four different ways, four different times, and you need to communicate what our values are. And then sometimes they don't get that, so we need to go eight times, eight ways. And sometimes they don't need to get that, so we go 16 times, 16 ways. Right. until they finally get it. And what I think that a lot of people as leaders feel super redundant because we think that our team knows what our values are, but our values live in our systems. So the way we pay our pay system, the way we communicate with our team, our communication mm -hmm. system, um, uh, you know, all these uh, hiring, we're going to be the very last week of this master share. We're going to be talking about hiring. Hiring is a system. So how we hire uh, and, and our values live in that system. So when, you know, to Jared's point, you know, how do we communicate when somebody is testing our values? If we have very clear values, and we hire properly, um, speaking in terms not necessarily of clients, but in, um, in, uh, uh, with, with, with a leadership or with, with our team, we have, if we hire properly, we hope that those people have the same values as we do because we've communicated and hired properly. Yeah. And it's, you know, and Kim, that's such a great point that you mentioned there. And honestly, it's the same leadership skills and communication skills that I use to be an effective communicator and leader is the same foundational system I use to market to clients. They don't know, your clients don't know what matters to you. So you have to put it out there four different ways, eight different ways, 16 different ways in order to attract the right people because people hear things differently. And there's always that opportunity to be able to make that connection from a different point of view. And it, you know, I'm clear on what mine are. I'm just putting them into different little categories to put them out there so that other people can connect with them. They don't always connect with one way, just like our teams don't, just like our clients don't. Yeah. And I like what I liked what Jared said here. What's the best way to No, He says there's a difference between a conversation and a communication with purpose. Yeah. And you know what? I think I think it can anything as long as you've got like a purpose, you know, you're leading it to the next direction, I think, or the next place, I think is beautiful. Yes. And and just so that we um, we're clear on our communication and just to reiterate one time and not assume that when people are joining in here, anybody who has any questions for Bonnie on communications, we talked about the three C's to communication, curiosity, compassion, and connection. So if you have any uh, questions for, for Bonnie um, and or I that we can answer, we'd be happy to answer that or comments on things that you agree with. And you know what? Make sure you guys to because I'm going to communicate um, with you. Make sure to push your love button for us so that we get lots of loves and funny faces and likes and wows. Um, <laughs> so that we know that you're there and, and you're, we're doing an okay job. Um, you know, the other thing, I have a couple, uh, a couple um comments here uh you know vulnerability you mentioned vulnerability a little a uh, little bit ago and um i think that 
you know, there's an old school way of leadership and a new school way of leadership. Mm -hmm. And there, the old school way of leadership is that you're never vulnerable. You've yeah. always got your suit of armor on. You never share anything about, you know, because vulnerability equals weakness, right? Then there's sort of this new school way of thinking that in order to connect with our team, in order to really, you know, leadership is all about influencing your team. So in order to be able to really influence your team in a way that is, um, is not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, manipulative. Yeah. Because I think the old school way of leadership um, was to manipulate through pay systems and performance and, you know, uh, you know, those are all manipulative ways to influence the behavior that you want to get. But there's this new way of thinking, Bonnie, that, that we as leaders should be, should have some vulnerability. Like I don't understand. And can you explain that to me? Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, I, I think that's a great point to um, that that you made in that us as leaders really the new there's a new school way of thinking in order to lead the millennials uh, and and this new Gen Z group that we need um, we need to have vulnerability in order to then be able to create influence. Mm -hmm. It's true. And I, you know, listen, I'm not the most vulnerable person. I have fighter going through my blood like the day is long. So for me to be vulnerable was probably one of my greatest lessons in life. I saw how it um, served me. I saw how it served me well, and it gave me that capacity to be able to, um, not get so stressed out about stuff in life. So being vulnerable is a, is a great asset to have. And as leaders, it's pro it's a vital one for you guys to be able to be more effective as communicators. You know, somebody will share with me, one of my, one of my clients will share with me and they'll say, well, this is what happened. And, you know, and this is what I wanted to say. And I'm like, well, why didn't you just say that? Because really when they're sharing it with me, they're being incredibly vulnerable because I'm safe, right? I'm safe. But if they shared it in that exact same way to the other person, they would have felt safe too. And the conversation could have gotten resolved. Whatever was going on could have, you know, been easily resolved. But we think that we have to be very strategic and, and, and have this strategy around communication and this particular way of being. And it's like, no, be yourself be vulnerable, be curious, be compassionate with yourself and the other person and see where it goes. Because a lot of times communication, you don't always have the answers to the end game on it. But if you listen and you're being vulnerable, the answers will always be there for you, always. And, and, it's, and it's good. And then you realize how fun it is to be able to lead and be that powerful person that you want to be in life. Um, and so Jared commented, so true, I have to be vulnerable every aspect of life. It opens you up to new ways of processing things. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I think that, um, I think this is uh, a new way of, of leadership that's, that's fairly new to people and it is very uncomfortable and like you said, I'm the, that fighter too. And I really had to fight to become the analyzer because when I was reading your post, I was thinking, okay, am I the 